From across time and space and throughout the multiverse, listen as multiple generations of geeks come together to discuss the iconic characters, events, and franchises that make up the very fabric of pop culture as we know it. Let Your Geek Side Show presents Then and Now. Hey guys, this is Kitty. This is Katie. And we are coming to you from the Sideshow Studios in Southern California. To me, my listeners, today we are delving into the evolution of one of the most beloved superhero teams of all time. This team of marginalized mutants has become a symbol for acceptance and understanding across pop culture, inspiring generations of fans through comics, beloved cartoons, and a number of films. While not every version of their story has lived up to its fullest potential, it's clear that the love for Marvel's mighty mutants only continues to grow with each era of Xavier's dream for coexistence. This is the X-Men Then and Now. All right, so Katie, thank you for joining me this week. It is super awesome. I'm really excited. I wish you guys could see, but uh, Katie is completely dressed for the occasion. She's got an X-Men hat, Wolverine shirt, and some earrings. Uh, she was she jumped at the chance to come do this, and so we are actually really excited. I know we've covered some um, X-Men characters before in the podcast. I know we did a Jean Grey one previously, but this one we're actually talking about the X-Men as a franchise, not just a team of people, like the actual entire history as much as we can uh, of the X-Men franchise and how it continues to evolve. Which is really exciting. A lot of it I'm still learning. So it's really neat for me. I grew up in a family where comics weren't really a big deal. So it was the occasional when I got to watch cartoons. And so Mm. then, you know, playing with my cousins and then becoming an adult and checking out the comic books. And now it's like, I need everything. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I totally feel that. I'm actually pretty recent to the X-Men myself. I I always found it to be really intimidating. And I actually came into comics at a time they were kind of downplaying the X-Men because the movie rights weren't uh, at the House of Mouse uh, yet with, with the MCU. Um, so I didn't really know where to jump in. Uh, I, I feel like I missed a formative uh, part of my childhood years because a lot of people cite X-Men the Animated Series as kind of their inspiration to to get into the the X-Men universe. That was absolutely where I got started. We love that show. I loved it as a kid. I would love to go just sit and binge watch it again. It's it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. I don't really know too many people who don't like it. And it's kind of great because then that inspired like, you know, kids playing the X-Men. Yeah. And, you know, I definitely did that myself. And (laughs) my go-to for was Storm because I just, I love, who doesn't want to have powers to control the weather and fly? It just seems super fun. Yeah. I, especially the, the costumes from that era are kind of some of the most cherished as well. Cause that, that era almost went hand in hand with the, um, the kind of Jim Lee launch of the X-Men. You, of course, you got that four cover spread of, of them all taking down Magneto or trying to take down Magneto. Um, but it, but a lot of X-Men, uh, fandom is really synonymous with that 90s imagery, which I think is really cool. It, it is really exciting. And then to sort of pick your favorite characters and sort of see what happens with them is really neat. Um, I would say my favorites as a kid are not the same as my favorites as an adult. And oh, really? I've gotten more into Magneto and I absolutely love the Juggernaut. Uh-huh. So he is one of my favorites and he's not actually technically a mutant. So that's what's kind of cool about him. And I didn't even learn that until, you know, a couple weeks ago. And I'm <laughs> just like, I love the Juggernaut. And I have to be honest, I absolutely loved Vinnie Jones playing the juggernaut Mm because I think he's fantastic. So that was really (laughs) fun for me. Excellent. Yeah, there there have been so many depictions of a lot of them are the same kind of core characters that show up time and time again on screen because they are our favorite ones. And a lot of them are the ones that kind of came about in the Claremont and Byrne era. Because, I mean, obviously we have the ones that were the Stanley, Jack Kirby, like first class, like original characters. But... um, the the Claremont and Byrne era, I'm thinking giant X, giant size X-Men number one, like that cover and everyone's just bursting through. I mean, it, it does surprise a lot of people to learn that Wolverine was not there from the start. Like that, that's kind of mind blowing. <laughs> it is. I'm also really thrilled that they've been doing reprints of those like first key issues because while I am a collector, I don't necessarily have the funds to spend on the X-Men number one. <laughs> And Colossus is another favorite. And Giant Science X-Men number one, understandably, is an expensive issue. Mm -hmm. But I can't really justify spending X amount, whatever it's being offered for, (laughs) X amount, to to get it in my collection. But when they Mm -hmm. do these reprints, it really does let collectors 
grab these issues that they may not be able to get at some point. You know, obviously, I still think it's something on my wish list. But with Colossus being a favorite, I need giant size X-Men number one, because that's where he shows up. And that's his first um, appearance. And, you know, looking, I grabbed the reprint of the very first X-Men. And to see the difference between Bobby Drake and X-Men number one (laughs) and Bobby Drake now is a huge difference. And even Jean Grey. And so oh the, gosh. and it was, you know, the sort of the, all the men going after Jean. And then <laughs> it's, it's sort of like fun to say, it's fun to see how it started and then watch it evolve. Oh, absolutely. Cause the, I mean, the name of the game with X-Men is evolution and, and they are the, the homo superior, uh, the, the name, like the name of the game is change. Um, when you brought up all the guys going after Jean, uh, Hasbro recently put out a three pack of the nineties themed with, uh, Wolverine, Jean Grey and Cyclops. And someone posted it on Twitter with the, the caption, this box just sighed at me and said, it's complicated. And like, it was so, I thought that was so funny, but, um, as a as a collector as well, like there's some of those issues where it's like I will never get my hands on this because it because it is so scarce and so expensive. But you, Marvel does a good job with the the reprints because you want to still be able to read those stories. Because even if you got your copy of of giant size X Men, it would if you wanted to even read the story, it would be like gloves and tweezers style. Like so the the fact that they make these uh, cheaper reprints is a really nice way to let fans know that these stories are still accessible. Like especially with the X Men because they're they're always a team for championing championing the underdog. Like the X Men are the ultimate underdogs, and um, I think in that. It, more recent years have explored a really interesting thing that there are some X-Men whose powers are more glamorous than the others. Um, I remember I, when I worked at a comic book store, there was a series called The Worst X-Men Ever. And uh, it it went through explaining a young boy who was identified as having the X gene, but he wasn't sure what his power was. And um, Beast, I believe it was, actually found out what his power was. And arguably, yes, his, this is the worst X-Men power. He has the power to explode, but only one time. And that, after that... That's it. Um, But I think and I think that um, after kind of the Claremont burn era and and some of the mutants started to get more popular, um, the writers did identify the writers and artists did identify the fact that like, yeah, some of the mutations suck. Like they really just suck. And that's where we have the Morlocks who hide in the sewers. And then we've got characters like uh, Skin and Maggot and Husk um, whose powers are all disgusting and and weird but they they still get a chance to be on teams like like generation x and and all these the, the fact that any mutant no matter the power can have a chance to to be a hero which is really neat to show both the bad and the good and then you just kind of have the strange like one of my favorite the dazzler oh i love and her and <laughs> she gets you know she gets taken over by one at one point and then she's actually hurting people and they realize, and what I like is, so I've been trying to get the brief history compacted. So if you're looking for a really great starting point to see if the X-Men is for you, the Grand Design series is fantastic. It starts at the very, very beginning with the start of Professor Xavier and Magneto and sort of their stories. And you'll see that they do really line up with everything. And then it brings you up through the fir- beginning of the X-Men and just keeps going throughout their whole history. And it's really great because it will also tell you what the key issues are that they're referencing in the back. Oh, that's always So if helpful. you're looking for something like they bring up the fact that Namor destroyed New York, they tell you which episode or which issues he appears in in X-Men d- with, with that. Oh, wow. So it's, you know, it's really useful, especially if you collect more than one thing and you know that who you're looking for is in the X-Men they may be able to tell you those issues in there as well. So that's not only a a compacted like 40 year history of the X-Men, but it's also like a handy dandy collector guide for like, if you want to learn a little bit more, go to these other books. I think, I think that's a, like a good assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's great to see because I don't know. I know some, but I would like to know more and at least getting the overarching ideas so you can sort of see things going. And I actually think it's useful for, for me at least with the new series, the, the house of X and powers of 10, because it gives a bit more background to what's going on. Cause I'll admit I'm a little confused, but I think <laughs> I'm figuring it out. So uh, it's great to have more of a frame of reference of the history leading up to that point, because a lot of the characters they introduce in those that I 
in particular remember are also in the grand design and it kind of gives you their background to know what's going on awesome and and i uh, correct me if i'm wrong i think that was art and writing by ed piskar from uh, i know he did hip-hop family tree um, but i'm not sure if he's the writer and the artist on the series i'm not 100 percent sure okay um i'm terrible should, at remembering those names should so. be enough information for someone to go to the comic book store though and 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 hit them up um, so yeah there are three they there's six total comics there's the X-Men Grand Design, X-Men Grand Design Genesis, and then Extermination Grand Design. I accidentally started with the first one and the last one and was like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> then I looked and realized, oh, right, because that's not the one you're supposed to start with. Okay. Um, before we go any further, because you did mention uh, the, the newest Marvel Comics event, which is, as my friends all call it uh, in abbreviation, Hawks Pox, but uh, it's House of X and Powers of 10, even though the X uh, in that case does stand for 10. Um, there will be... Maybe brief spoilers. Uh, if you're not caught up, it is a weekly series that is moving pretty quickly. Um, but for the uninitiated, um, I, as I said, or maybe I didn't say, uh, maybe I just thought about it. Um, I came into the Marvel Comics universe uh, in the kind of Marvel Now era in about 2011, 12. Um, that's when I like seriously started picking up monthly books. Um, and at that time, they they were really downplaying the X-Men. Um because the movie rights didn't belong to Marvel Studios and they were downplaying the Fantastic Four and a lot of people were kind of concerned about that. Um, but fast forward to now and uh, Jonathan Hickman, who uh, I think the last thing he did for Marvel was the Secret Wars comic in 2015. That's also a running joke in this podcast. I always try to bring up Secret Wars at any given instant uh, because that the 2015 version of that story was hugely um, formative for what's going on now. Um, but he came back and he said, hey, Marvel, I've got a pitch for you and I'm going to – this is my uh, plan to kind of refresh the X-Men and what I – Jonathan Hickman comes knocking at your door and he says he needs you to quietly kind of cancel, not cancel, but like twilight all the um, X-Men books going on at the time. So uh, like uh, Mr. and Mrs. X and all the uncanny and whatever teams were going on at that time, they all came to their conclusion. And now it's uh, it's Hickman for the next 12 weeks on uh, House and Powers. And then they've got this kind of new era of X-Men starting in the fall, which which is actually pretty exciting. I'm my personal favorite X-Men team of all time is Excalibur. Uh, so I'm very excited to see uh, Teeny Howard is bringing that one back. Um, oh, I didn't catch the name of the artist on that one. But um, Psylocke is now or Betsy Braddock is Captain Britain and she's leading that iteration of Excalibur. So that's really exciting to see. But they are doing big, broad brushstrokes. Um, to kind of reinvent the X-Men universe. I mean, you're caught up, right? It, we've got House 1 and 2 and Powers 1 at the time of this podcast. Yeah, so, and then I think Powers has 2 and 3 coming out before the next House. Yeah, and, well, and House just dropped a bombshell. Yes. Okay, so, so. Here, here's the spoiler. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the X-Men, uh, Moira McTaggart... Is, an, is a mutant, and not only that, she might be one of the most powerful ones that we've seen uh, because of the potential of her ability. Which, which is insane, and I was just, you know, because she sits down in the beginning, and you're just like, I feel like I know who this is, but I'm not really sure I can remember who it is. Yeah. And then they go through the whole entire thing, and when you combine it with, for me at least, since I did the grand design right before or right after actually reading that that book, it really helped solidify what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's super useful that they provide the timelines for her in the back because it helps sort of straighten things out. Um, it's a little confusing. I'm you know <laughs> still a little confusing with the Krakoa and all the everything that's going on, but yeah. it's it's phenomenal so it's really exciting yeah and for those of you who may like tangentially be familiar she's kind of one of those um the supporting characters who pops up every once in a while but like because there's been so many reboots and rewrites in marvel comics you're like but didn't she die but also didn't this happen and this happen but um hickman revealed that he's like hey and it, and it, the fact that it also like kind of works with so much of the history of the x-men that she actually has the power of reincarnation um and so she has multiple lives through which she's learned how her actions will affect the X-Men. And one of her lives, she was trying to eradicate the X gene. And in another, she was working to protect the X-Men. So it's, it's, 
it's crazy, and and we're still only one third of the way through that series. So there's, I'm sure there's so many more bombshells about to be dropped. But it's just this fascinating uh, exercise because the long and short of it is Xavier is creating a new kind of territory for the mutants to live, and it's it's Krakoa. Um, and actually, Krakoa is. Uh, if you guys want to learn a little bit more about him, you can check out our top ten plant powered uh, comic book characters podcast we did a couple weeks ago. Um, or maybe last week by the time this airs. Um, but it, it's really cool. So he's like growing seeds to like make this new territory. And the X-Men have tried this before. There was Asteroid M and there was Genosha. And and so it it's always where does this grand experiment of the mutants are going to live somewhere else and be safe. And uh, like how's that going to turn out for them? But, but it's really exciting. It is super exciting. And Krakoa in the earlier series too, he's just – they he they sort of he lures the mutants to him mm-hmm. and drains their powers and then you have this whole situation where a lot of the original team from the very beginning doesn't want to go do stuff anymore because they're not quite full powered anymore mm-hmm. um, and you realize that Kirko is actually a really powerful mutant and just sort of kind of disappears at that point <laughs> so it's it's really interesting to see what happens and the combination of Moira with Destiny is yeah. really interesting too. Um th- and Destiny's just such an interesting character within herself of of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And so to have the interaction of someone who can reincarnate and the someone who can see the future is a little bit trippy, but it's kind of yeah. it's super cool to see one and I have to say one of my favorite is sort of rebirth that Moira had was when be- she becomes one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. I was super excited. I think that apocalypse is underrated. I, you know, I'm, I did like the movie. I thought it was kind of fun and enjoyable, but apocalypse is just such a crazy character. And to have the four horsemen who mm-hmm. can be pretty much anybody that he, he chooses. And then to have her be the right hand trying to destroy things is really, really neat. Yeah. So so that was how she chose to spend one of her lives. And I love that Destiny said that you I only see ten lives for you, eleven if you make the right choices in the next one. Like, and that's so that's so ominous. And she's on life number nine, uh, I believe, when when we get to the comics. Um I want to jump back to the idea that you brought up because I love Krakoa, but the idea that some of the mutants weren't fully powered. On the flip side, um, one of the more interesting developments and and literally evolutions was when they introduced secondary mutations for the characters because a lot of fans didn't like that at first but some of some of the secondary mutations now are synonymous with the characters um and then i know recently they did an event where they tried to introduce tertiary mutations with like this thing called the mother vine and that one didn't go over super well i didn't hear a lot of people talking about it but um many of you may not know uh, like Emma Frost, her diamond form wasn't originally part of the package and Beast wasn't originally blue. And so they introduced this this secondary mutation that's like, oh, your X gene can continue to change you. Um, and a lot of fans at the time were kind of like, eh, I don't, I don't know if I, I dig that. But now like, tr- like when people see Beast not blue, they're like, who is that guy? He looks really weird. Like, yeah, seeing him look like a giant dude with massive hands and feet and no blue it was a little jarring like reading that reading that comic and i think i uh, bobby drake is an excellent version of that because he's literally he looks like a snowman with no face and boots <laughs> in the first one and now you have him as Iceman. yeah where it's more of a it's clear i mean he you you know he's human or a mutant human obviously but it's now clear there's a man under whatever his when you know when he changes himself, it's clear that he's still Bobby Drake versus yeah, he's like this crystalline. amorphous ball of snow. <laughs> yeah, and even um, even characters like Jean Grey, uh, Marvel Girl, when she started out, and then the fact that she went through the Phoenix evolution and that the Phoenix Force is a whole different ballpark, um, which we could probably and I know we covered the Phoenix Force a lot in the Jean Grey then and now podcast, but like that's a whole other thing because then you have like the Phoenix Force Five when like multiple mutants have to to bear uh host to parts of the phoenix and and um it it's just it's crazy and like at hand in hand almost with those additional mutations is like clones like you can guarantee because the x-men a lot of it is genetic like so much of their their story is genetic and so then 
pretty much every X-Men has a clone running around somewhere, um, which I think is fascinating. And and uh, recently, Laura Kinney was actually debunked as – not debunked, but uh, Tom Taylor in the Adamantium Agenda – um, had Mr. Sinister's uh, DNA kind of research reveal that she's actually the biological daughter of Wolverine, but uh, she herself was cloned and and that made her sister Gabby. Um, Magneto had a clone named Joseph. It's just like every, everybody's got a clone. Yeah, most of them seem to have one. Um, there are a few exceptions where I think I think Juggernaut is probably one of the few exceptions since he gets his if I can ever remember what the name of the jewel is called, he gets his power the, from the jewel. The Crimson Gem of Ciderac. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that, <laughs> so he, I mean, that is shared. There's a really awesome storyline where Colossus becomes the Juggernaut. And you put two of my favorite characters into <laughs> one. Um, that would be, if that was ever turned into a statue, I don't think anybody could put that on a table. It would be so big. <laughs> Which, for the record, it's not an announcement. It's just wishful thinking. That's that's, that's my personal dream. It's definitely not say, <laughs> saying anything's outcoming. It's but, just yeah, it's interesting because because as you noted earlier in the podcast, Juggernaut's not technically a mutant, and I I I just have to remember that when I'm talking about him. I'm like, hey, like it's so easy to say the Marvel mutants because it's it's alliterative, alliterative, but he's not a mutant. Um, it's still also, weird to me that he's Professor X's stepbrother. Yeah. So it's, you know, and you get to see at least, you know, like I said, if you're looking for a good overarching history, the grand design and the grand design shows you their first interactions. And then he sort of disappears until he comes back and mm-hmm. then you realize who he is. Yeah. And and, on, and with clones, also complicated families. I think that's part of the X-Men package is, is just having a complicated as hell family. Um what was I going to say about Juggernaut? Oh, I love his name. I love his uh, the the fact that his name is a pun. Um, his name is Cain Marco, which if you know your if you know Bible history, uh, the mark of Cain is like the the mark that like he cannot be harmed. Um, and so his name is Cain Marco, and so this, it kind of plays into the fact that he's an unstoppable force once he gets moving. Like no one can touch him. Uh, which when I realized that, I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Like, but I think that's super funny. Um, let me see. I got. I've got so many notes here. I mean, we've barely scratched the surface on films. Do you want to talk about the X Men films a little bit? Sure. I was really super excited when uh, they they came out with the the first ones. It was really great to see some of your characters. Now, I, you know, I think all of us have our perfect idea in our head, and maybe it doesn't quite reflect that. But that doesn't mean they're not good movies. Mm-hmm. I think, in my opinion, a lot of the the trouble with some of the movies today is is people are so we're so invested and there's nothing wrong with being invested but you know we have to understand also i try and take them as entertainment first yeah because i think if you know not that i haven't ever yelled at a movie screen (laughs) about something but you know i want to enjoy what i enjoy the most so i'm going to try and just focus on the fact that it's even if it's not everything perfect in my mind, it's still a great mm-hmm. storytelling experience to sit through. Um, and, I, you know, I always – Rogue is a favorite of mine. I was thrilled with Hugh Jackman is, as Wolverine. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I, I'm i pretty much a big fan of most of all of those people. So it's it's yeah. great. Um, and I love the interaction between Sabretooth and Wolverine. That's also a really great one to see, mm-hmm. especially – their whole storyline, which they do in one of the movies, I'll I'll get all the names of which one comes first wrong because I'm (laughs) really terrible with things like that. But I I enjoyed all of them. I own a great deal of them. I mean, Logan was fantastic. Logan. And that, see, that is a great, like, because that story had, I know there was Old Man Logan, but really that story was not adapted in that way. Um, But the idea... um, that they that this is this is still part of that universe and and we get to see like a, a interesting alternate future that I I just think it it left on such a hopeful note I know it was super sad to see Logan die but like the idea that first of all you got this tiny adorable X twenty three who's like I would follow her into battle anywhere but you've got the next the next generation of mutants but you've also got the idea of the kids growing up with the X Men as like a mythological hero kind of thing and it's like oh the X Men will save us like we've got the comics like this is that thing and that was such a fascinating like thought experiment for that film universe like when they when they acknowledge the fact that the heroes do exist in that universe and and become symbols and and for some people 
they're they're still hated mutants and people are afraid of them. But then for other people like that, they are a symbol of hope. You know, they they always say that, you know, legends have some truth in history. And for that specific thing with the kids, like, you're in my comic book. Mm -hmm. You're real. So part of this has to be real. And, you know, we can do all these great things. It's I think it's really hopeful for the kids to see, oh, okay, well, it's not in, in that universe specifically. It's not just a comic book. It's some of this is true. You're telling me some of this is true. And I know that's you. So stop trying to tell me that you didn't do stuff. Yeah, because it, it, it really also plays into the idea that the X-Men have, I mean, at first... I think when they did, de- I mean, they've always been a symbol for the underdog and the marginalized and the and and um, the underrepresented voice. But like, I think especially as time has gone on and our society has evolved and also devolved in some ways, like that that part of the story in the movie, it's it's also the representation because it's like I'm like the little kids who are like I'm also a mutant and I see you as like a as a as a touchstone. And so while as far as I know, the X-Men aren't real in our universe. I mean, some people – I've seen some people with some weird uncanny abilities that I'm like, that might be a mutant power. It's not like a Wolverine status mutant power, but like, okay, there might be X-Men out there. But um, to have that – to feel that representation, um, and I think the X-Men have been great characters for that just across the board because that's what they stand for. Um, and then I think on the f- – on not on the flip side, but in that same vein of like taking very – um, underappreciated characters. I think the Deadpool movies, um, like, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who like, I'm like, if someone comes into the comic book store that I work at and asks me if we've got new mutants 98, like one more time, I'm going to like pitch myself through the window. Um, so I was a little like hesitant. I was like, okay, like really like Deadpool. Um, but those, those movies, speaking of just wanting to have fun, like those are some of the most uproarious movies. They do a great job with the greatly, uh, reduced cast of X Men that they get to have, like the fact that they and I, they pulled out all those X Force like deep cut like Shatterstar Zeitgeist and I mean Zeitgeist is the ecstatics so like we that was crazy but the fact that they were like okay we're not we're not the A team top string X Men we're gonna do what we can with that Negasonic Teenage Warhead Angel Dust like all these characters that it's like those are not even the if if I asked you to think of a cool X Men. And I said, okay, not that one. Try again. Not that one. Like, you wouldn't even get to those guys by, like, the fifth or sixth go around. Um, well, and I, what I also like is some of the ones that are sort of introduced as the quote-unquote villains, like Emma Frost. And I had another really good one in my head. Um, you know, they will come they, back to you. <laughs> yeah. So they'll, they'll have them as the dark X-Men or they'll have them as um, – because she's called the White Queen and they have that whole sort of chess – set of bad people hellfire club there we go i was like i know i know this word it's just escaping (laughs) me right now so they you know she starts in the hellfire club and then they add some of the mutants that we know very very well some of them stay on the side of evil so to speak but some of them come around and then you have the mutants like namor who show up in both the dark x-men and in the actual x-men as well and and throughout the marvel universe Mm -hmm. so it's really great that they can sort of pull from everywhere and there have always been all types Mm -hmm. it's you know aurora monroe they've you know there's always been someone from somewhere all across the world and i think that's what's the one of the most unique things is a lot of the I think, in my opinion, a lot of the other universes and worlds and everything, it they'll introduce them, but they weren't there necessarily to begin with. Yeah, Thunderbird is there from the beginning. You know, Storm is there from the beginning. It it was just like, well, these we're going to put these people in there, and this is what they do, and it was awesome. Yeah, and another thing that I really like is the because um, sometimes when you're in the Marvel universe and especially watching the the Marvel cinematic movies, you're like, oh my god, poor New York, like it's it's all happening right here. Um, but the comics have also done a really great job recently of introducing uh, the idea that there are mutants everywhere. Because um, uh, Tom Taylor and uh, Muhammad Azrar did X Men Red with Jean Grey leading the team, and that was a really really kind of international team. They had a Wakandan mutant, and then they had a, a mutant from India. India, and then they had X-23 and her sister Gabby, who was going by Honey Badger. And so it, it is this idea that it's that the mutant identity and, and even the mutant prejudice, um, prejudice against mutants, is everywhere in the Marvel Universe. And so you can have those really globetrotting stories 
Um, again, my favorite team is Excalibur. And so like you've got that in like kind of the UK division uh, strangeness going on fighting aliens like the TechNet. And I just I love that um, kind of idea that it is that it is a global and sometimes it's even in outer space. Like, I mean, once you get into the space and the Shi'ar stuff, I get a little like, whoa, uh, with the X-Men. But it's just it. I like that the idea that it's not just like, oh, it's another five boroughs in New York that are getting attacked again. And who's going to step up and fix that? Like, it, it is a kind of a, a big experience. The, it is a big experience. You also have the swashbucklers, like that whole series, which I'm really hoping that they'll get a lot of those characters will get looped back in because they're really fun. Yeah, like the the upcoming Marauders book. Um, I I've I've been so bad about remembering the artists, and I'm so sorry. I will uh, do my penance for that. But I know Jerry Duggan's writing it, and Russell Dodderman is doing the covers for the upcoming Marauders series, and um, that'll be nice to see. Um, I, I know that one's fun because Emma Frost is like funding their venture from frost enterprises and it's like that's kind of nefarious and i want to see where that's going um but yeah and um you brought up the hellfire club um i i just wanted to touch on that briefly that like that's also a huge part of the dark phoenix saga which unfortunately is one of the most beloved (laughs) x-men unfortunately one of the most beloved x-men stories that never gets told completely right and i think because a lot of people leave out the Hellfire Club, like a, they, um, in the very short-lived uh, Fox series, The Gifted, which gifted was a nice code word for mutant, um, they had the Hellfire Club and they actually had the Stepford Cuckoos, the, or they called them the Frost Sisters. I don't think they necessarily called them the Cuckoos in the series. Um, but yeah, I, I know that um, the X-Men, the animated series did did the the um, Dark Phoenix saga really well, but a lot of these other places they don't they don't get into that part of the mythos, um, which I think I I love the Hellfire Club so much. Well, that's what's also so exciting about Disney having acquired Fox is what they are able to do now with the movies, and and it's not to take anything away from the movies that have been, mm-hmm. but the movies that could be are just phenomenal. Yeah, and and to explore really because I think a lot of people I think get confused with the Dark Phoenix, and when you sort of throw in the two two of the embodiments in the same movie, I think it's a little confusing if you don't know the backstory and sort of what's going on and why they you know why it's worth fighting over. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and I think that you know. Jean Grey and her different Phoenix transformations are all really unique. You know, the red, the Phoenix in the red is completely different than the Phoenix in the green. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons for both of them. And I think that they could do something really amazing just with that whole separate story too, with the Shi'ar and all that would be amazing because it's a whole different race that sort of gets touched on a lot, but you know, there's a lot you could do with them as well. Mm-hmm. And it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, at this point in time, there are no definite uh, announcements from Marvel about what's coming. But at the the absolute bombshell uh, Hall H panel at Comic-Con this last year, Kevin Feige announced the slate up through like 2022 or 2021. And he said, and we didn't even get to touch on the Fantastic Four and the X-Men and, and all these guys. And so um, it'll be a few years before we get to see the mutants in action. But I but I do agree that with the potential um, there. I mean, it'll be interesting to see if they choose to fold in Deadpool. I mean, he was such a popular character. Um, of course, I'm sure we're going to see Wolverine. Uh, I know they they said if, if any of the characters from the previous films that they did just acquire – um, come into it, they're going to be doing a total recasting. But I think not only do they have a chance to really give us some definitive versions of characters like Storm and maybe Jean Grey and and maybe Gambit and Rogue and stuff like that, I think that what Marvel has exceeded at with names like Guardians of the Galaxy and Ant-Man, uh, taking those characters who are not the, the A-listers, um, they don't have to go as far down as like Zeitgeist and Bedlam where Deadpool did, but you can bring in some of those middle tier X-Men characters and give them a chance like generation X and the new mutants. I know the new mutants film is kind of in hot water right now, but um, those kinds of characters who they're in the teams, they're all around. I mean, there's nothing that special effects wizards can't do at this point. I'm concerned, but um, just the, 
the limitless potential, I think, to to realize these characters on screen um, is really exciting. And I can't wait to see what they announce. Well, and, and in the breadth of just like all of the different with all of the different X-Men, all of the different mutants, they appear in almost all of the different universes. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's the first mutant or whether it's, you know, our our favorites, you know, they interact with Black Panther. They interact with the Fantastic Four. There are so many opportunities to bring in some of the lesser known characters who actually threw out a lot of the story arcs. Um, mm-hmm. I will always harp on Namor because he is my absolute <laughs> favorite and technically the first mutant. Uh, as as he's portrayed and said by Marvel in many of the comics and actually predates Marvel Comics itself. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, they have opportunities to bring in characters like those who interact with so many others. Yeah. And, you know, a lot, the movies have been great, but I'm super stoked for the Fantastic Four show. I'm really excited to see what what they do with everything, not just not just the X-Men. You really open it up to everyone and mm-hmm. to be able to see what, the X-Men do, who they choose to have them interact with, what other characters they they bring in, because they can interact with the Avengers. They do fairly often in the in the comics as well. Mm-hmm. So there are so many different opportunities to have these beloved characters from all story arcs interact. Yeah, and I think Marvel Marvel's in a really good spot right now that the Infinity Saga has kind of closed off and they and the first film up for their next slate is going to be a pretty cool with Black Widow. Um they have some smart opportunities to make it organic and not just I would be surprised if they did a the mutants have been here the whole time we just never acknowledge them. I almost think they're going to more organically um step it forward from like hey like We'll probably explore the results of the snap and maybe this created some, but I, I mean, we can't, we could speculate all day long, but I think, I think it would be smarter of them not to say, oh, the X-Men were here the whole time. You just never heard about them, but instead give an organic reason as to why uh, they are just now appearing in the universe. And from that, you could have limitless potential of like they're now they're appearing everywhere and and we have to do something and organize a school. Um, And in the, in the, the talking of who interacts with who, I mean, I, the last thing I have to bring up that I just thought was the most um, interesting because of the era in which I started reading the comics um, and they didn't really have a lot of, they didn't have the rights to the X-Men for film and they didn't really want to push the comics because there were there were X-Books happening. Um, the Inhumans, I think it was really interesting that that was the, and the Inhumans have been around for a while, not as long as the X-Men, but the fact that that was kind of the alternative of like, oh, like they can manifest weird powers like the Terragenesis and like, um, but the fact that they then said, and they, and they keyed a whole event around it, that X-Men and the Inhumans can't coexist. Cause I mean, the whole deal for the X-Men is can the X-Men and humans coexist? But the fact that they said the Inhumans, literally the, the process by which an Inhuman is activated uh, the, with the Terrigen Mist, that is toxic to the X-Men and will kill them. And it, and I, I would be curious to know if, um, if the Inhumans had been given a warmer reception by fans, if Marvel would have played them up a little more. I mean, we do have some fantastic ones who stuck around like um, Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel and Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Um, but they did a whole event where it was like the it was Inhumans versus X-Men and the X-Men were like, hey, like you guys are literally killing us because of the, the Terrigen clouds. And then Medusa was like, OK, well, we'll destroy the last of the Terrigen clouds. So no new Inhumans will be made. I almost wonder if that was Marvel saying, OK, guys, like we get it. You really want the X-Men back. We'll stop making new Inhumans. Um, uh, because it, it was weird. It, it became a, like, Hey, could these be your alternative to the X-Men? And people were like, no, cause you can't replace the X-Men and, and the X-Men are underdogs. Whereas the, the Inhumans, they're also a genetic experiment from the Cree. Um, and, and so they have that underdog potential, but for some reason they just didn't take as popularly as the X-Men. I think, you know, I don't know as much about the Inhumans, although I'm a big fan of Lockjaw, um, mainly because I have a bulldog and he's adorable. So, <laughs> But I think the problem is the X-Men are so popular that you really, if they were perceived by anyone as, okay, this is their replacement, I just, I don't, you as you were saying, I you just can't. Yeah. Like it's, they're the X-Men. It's whether you love or hate the characters, you know, they're the X-Men. Yeah. And, you know, it's really interesting to see what what various people think about various characters. You know, their whole like articles about, I, I saw one because Gambit's one of my favorite and it's 15 reasons why Gambit is the worst. Now, <laughs> 
it's really actually pretty funny to read because they're not really wrong with what they're saying, but yeah. I still, to me, those are sort of what make him the best. Well, and we all know that Professor Xavier is a jerk and yeah. uh, <laughs> deep cut uh, reference. And and I mean, I always laugh when I see Scott Summers because we, we have someone in the office who says that Scott Summers is one of the best X-Men villains because he's like, he's always, he's, he's not, for those who genuinely don't know, he's not, he's one of the teammates, um, but some of the, some of his, behaviors it's just like come on scott come on um but yeah i mean th- and i think that's the what's great about the x-men too is they all have the duality like it's not like they're just uh, you know good or just bad or you know you know cyclops is always he's sometimes he's just totally fine and sometimes you're like dude what are you doing yeah it's and, not like you're a mutant so you're always right because people don't like you but you're fighting for your rights like sometimes sometimes you're wrong dude like yeah, and then the like the X Men Extermination series is a whole other ball game, which is really interesting to see, mm-hmm. and it's it's really neat to see how they do all these different story arcs. So I'm really, you know, while it was kind of sad to see those end, I sort of came through with the comics starting really uh, with the the wedding of Kitty Pride and Colossus because okay. Colossus is one of my favorites. I saw the cover and I was like, I need this. I came home and my husband had it on the bed and I was like, yeah, it's okay. And so then it was the whole hunt for, you know, the X-Men gold and, and then, you know, being like, oh my gosh, I forgot about this. And then he brought me one of his favorite X-Men that he remembers, which is sort of, it's a, it's, you can find it in a trade paperback. I don't remember exactly. I think it's called victims and it's got Wolverine and Gambit. Mm -hmm. And basically from my understanding gambit and i need to read it but gambit is in london and they're sort of looking for the next jack the ripper and they think it's wolverine (laughs) and so it's kind of that story and it's like the creativity that they've gotten with a lot of these older lesser known stories is Mm -hmm. really amazing yeah i i mean it it is just a testament to the idea that that Jack Kirby and Stanley came up with that this idea of mutants is infinitely mutable and changeable. Um, so I think we're winding down a little bit now, but we do always like to give people kind of a recommendation. So just as your uh, Katie's personal Rex for like any X-Men comic story movie that you want people to check out, if they're looking to know a little bit more about the X-Men, then I would absolutely have to suggest the grand design because it, as I said, it's a six comic series, um, two comics each of the like of the sets and it b- gives you an overarching understanding of the universe and everything sort of the X-Men have gone through. So if you're a little confused about things that you may have seen in the movies and don't quite understand, um, they definitely reference the Phoenix force quite a bit because it's such a huge central part of what goes on. So I think it'll give you a really great reference point to jump in. And if you turn to the back and you're like, okay, I want, I want this story arc, you'll be able to find it. It tells you where. Awesome. Uh, I think for me, of course, I think anyone should go back and give X-Men the Animated Series a rewatch. It is now over 25 years old. There's also a great book called Previously on X-Men that uh, Eric and Julia Leewald, the showrunners, um, and then a number of the writers like Len Yuli, Larry Houston, who's one of the production designers, um, they put together this this really uh, kind of ultimate retrospective on that animated series, which was so formative for a lot of people. I mean, I know that series inspired some of my favorite comic book artists. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Russell Dodderman, who's now doing covers on the Marauders book. But like he 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 shared on his Instagram these drawings that he did in like 95 of like Jean Grey and then like the Jean Grey he was professionally paid to draw in 2017. Um, and then I think there's so there's so many X-Men books um, if you're listening currently, check out House of X and Powers of Ten because those are mind-boggling. Um, but for anyone who's kind of like wondering what the what the relevance is of X Men in the modern age, um, I highly, highly recommend uh, X Men Red by Tom Taylor and uh, Mohammed Azrar. Um, that one was really, I think it was only 11 issues, but it was just a really good series that got to the heart of the empathy and the understanding for other identities. Um, that the X-Men has always strived for because the X-Men at the end of the day are still as much as we love them and champion them in their own universe. They are the ultimate underdogs with the full potential of the X gene yet to be unlocked. It is exciting to see Marvel take strides to reinvent and reinvigorate the X-Men franchise. These characters inspire us to stand up and embrace our uniqueness because that is our true strength. Countless storytellers have even been inspired by works like X-Men, the animated series. And now it's time for the next evolution. 
From the massive House of X and Powers of Ten events going on right now at Marvel Comics to the highly anticipated future of the Mighty Mutants on film as a result of the Fox acquisition by Disney, it's clear that Wolverine, Storm, Jean Grey, and all the rest of our favorites are set to change and adapt in never-before-seen ways. Thank you for joining us. This has been X-Men Then and Now. Do you enjoy listening to Then and Now? We are proud to bring you pop culture content completely ad-free, but that doesn't mean we don't need your support to help keep us going. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting platform and help spread the word about our podcast. We welcome fan feedback. Email us at podcasts at sideshow.com with your thoughts and suggestions for how we can make our shows even better. Plus, tune in for our full network of pop culture podcasts. See if your fan favorites make the cut in the Geek Culture Countdown, a bi-weekly podcast featuring pop culture top 10 lists. Hear exclusive interviews with celebrities and pop culture industry leaders as they let their geek side show in Look Who Showed Up. Join comedian Jeff May and his special guests as they discuss anything and everything in Sideshow's Sideshow. Then get all the latest pop culture news with our daily briefing, a two-minute breakdown of the biggest geek headlines perfect for your Alexa or Google News briefings. We wouldn't exist without your continued support. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to let your geek side show.